Hello, welcome. This is Lessons for Full Spectrum Humans, the fifth webinar of the 2017 series, and this is April 9th of 2017. I am beginning with an animation over here. Here. This is a, an original animation that I created, the conception of the flying rainbow lasagna. If you want to watch the whole thing, check it out on YouTube, and there's beautiful original music from an uh, uh, original composer that is in here. I'm scrolling forward because I want you to get to the end. So here's some of the most relevant stuff over here. We're looking at these, we're looking at these shapes that look like abstract bubbles, but these aren't abstract bubbles. These are simplifications of the time field. And this little part over here is going to show you how this relates to your body so that you're starting to understand that this is your body when you see these shapes jumping up and down. All right, so you can see that those dots represent aspects of your energy field and they are simplified. So now when you see this jumping all around, I want you to think that's a person jumping all around, all right? Let me fast forward a little bit more so that we don't have to go through all of this. But look, oh my goodness, that is, those are people, those are aspects of self jumping around. All right, and now when we get up to this part, this is the most relevant part that I want to show you because, hold on a second, I like to say, if a picture is worth a thousand words, and a uh, picture's worth a million words, animation is worth 10 billion. All you need to do is look at this, and I want you to look at the way that the energy curves around one of these structures. Like if we call this a half vortex, this area right here, you're going to look at the way that the energy curves around that half vortex because there is a dot oscillating up and down. And then look at how all of the red areas connect together. Oh no, someone says they're staring at a blank screen. Well, okay, hopefully, hold on a second. All right, uh, stop share. And hey, um, hopefully that actually came through. Um, ah, so sorry if that was a black screen. Can you, can you guys now see my face? Say in the chat if you can. Good, okay. So utter apologies, I was using that function for the first time. <sighs> Next time, I won't do it in that way. I have an animation on YouTube that is called The Conception of the Flying Rainbow Lasagna. Apologies, my utter apologies. What that animation showed, technology isn't working with us and helping us today, is the way that this shape is actually created as the end result of a movement. And when that movement happens, I have a smaller one that's a little bit easier for me to get on screen. This dot, this violet dot, is jumping up and down very fast. So as it jumps up, it's like in exactly the same way that a, a ship that is at sea leaves a wake behind it. Imagine a particle of energy is jumping through time and time is like water and it's actually leaving a wake behind it. So this particle jumps from here up to here and in creating that movement, it creates this first flange structure. Then this jumps back down to here and then it creates this lower flange. And then it jumps back up to here and it creates this upper one. The animation showed it beautifully, but we are going to find a way in order to do this. This is how you actually play your genetic strings. How do you get it to jump? I'm gonna get into that and I'm gonna draw a picture of what this whole entire time field is because this is the singularity. So this is the first thing because part of it, how do you get it to jump? Part of that is an intellectual exercise. Literally, you exercise your mind and have new concepts and that's how it jumps. The thing that we are making jump is this, this convergence point. This is the singularity. So by definition, there's only one of it. It is the doorway that we use to enter infinity. And we have not just one of these inside of us. We have 
many, many, many of these inside of us, and they all go to the same place. When we do the flying rainbow lasagna, what we're doing is making this dot jump. Uh, well, it would be like jumping towards your screen and then back away from your screen and towards me. But before we get to that, first, the structure of the time field. So now let me go to the whiteboard so that I can draw all of this. So also when I hold up that yellow sculpture and here, um, this is a cross section uh, and a simplification of that yellow structure. Like here's the basic simplified energy center or chakra shape. And we don't just, that's one donut or torus, but we actually have another one that goes around like this and like this, that's at 90 degrees. That's really the full shape of what you have but you don't just have one of those. And I, I've also drawn here, I'll change it to a different color. I've also drawn how there are timelines that go up like this, but that's a simplification. They don't go up like that. They actually curl around like this, all right? Um, this does not exist in a vacuum. This actually exists in a matrix or a tessellation or a giant world of other shapes i'm changing a different color wait 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 here this one is over here like this bear with me i know that sometimes these sketches are a little bit um rough because the electric pen doesn't work that smoothly and perfectly i'm trying to get it okay and you also you also have another one up here up here like this and so there's another vortex shape there, vortex shape there, another one like this, another one like this. So we're trying to get across the idea that you don't just have one of these that um, exists uh, with nothing around it. You have a whole field of these. This is what the time field is. And let me draw another one over here. You have all of these lovely vortices that all fit together perfectly. And these are all vortices of time. So this has to do, and this is, you know, implied. You have these dots here. Now I'm just going to start making these and implying it. And here, I'm switching to black. So this, let's say the singularity is black. Bear with me. I know I'm squinting. I squint a lot. I'm trying to make these drawings. The drawings are very messy. Same singularity in all of these little spots that I've got over here. Same singularity. And what actually forms these shapes, even be, before we start to do the flying rainbow lasagna, is that jumping back and forth motion of the zeroth dimension. Okay, so everybody, this is great, because this is like, if you've been in the class and if you've done the other webinars, you're like, wait, I know what she's talking about. I know what the zeroth dimension is. So the zeroth dimension, this is from um, you know, the basic building blocks of how we build the dimensions. If I start with this dot, and that dot is infinity, here's the infinity symbol, and it's the presence of everything, all possibilities and all probabilities. And in previous webinars, I described how the big leap of consciousness, the biggest thing that ever happened was when that dot, that is everythingness, had to at some point think, what would happen if some aspect of me was not with me? If everythingness was not here with me as part of everythingness, but was instead over here and that was the greatest conception or conceptual leap that ever had to happen because then this dot could connect to this dot and that creates a line the first dimension okay that zeroth dimension making that leap of consciousness is what makes these shapes happen i'm drawing this really messy but what you're seeing here is we have a grid of two energy that moves in two different directions right now i'm drawing a straight line with my black magic marker on the screen you see these black lines straight black lines now i'm erasing all those straight black lines now i'm going to highlight in yellow all of the circles these are all of the circles energy moves in circular patterns and energy moves in straight lines and it's almost as if there are two different realities the pathway of circular movement and the pathway of straight line movement but now i want to get even more sophisticated on this with you when you see a straight line like this what i want you to envision is that it's actually a hula hoop and you're looking at it edge on so if this is if you're the observer standing here at this little asterisk that i just drew and you're staring at this it's a hula hoop and you're seeing it 
as a flat line, but you're understanding that it's a hoop, that it actually goes around in a big giant circle. So, I mean, a lot of this is like requiring you mentally adding in another dimension in order to understand these diagrams. The, this is the basic jumping back and forth pattern of consciousness in the time field that creates the living time field. It is this zeroth dimension that decides, oh, one day I'm going to jump from here. I just highlighted it here, giant purple dot in this purple one. One day I just decided I wanted to jump over to here. And what that did was made this vortex shape over here. But what happened was at that same exact moment that that black dot made it to this infinity area, an equal force from all of the other directions also made it to that area. So I know that's a super messy diagram, but if you can imagine my fists came together like this and my fists came together like this, everybody was an equal force in perfect balance coming together through time. And what that made happen was, here I'll show it in yellow, all of these energies that were colliding together here reflected off of each other and then they all bounced back out over to here and then you bounce back over to here and you bounce back over to there and you bounce back over to there. So what I'm trying to get across with this is the idea that this, because I always show you just one of these, we have a whole, we have a nested system of these and these do not exist in, without context. These all exist next to one another. So there's another one that exists here. There's another one that exists here. And the singularity inside of there is constantly jumping back and forth between these two places. So this is the idea of infinity. That infinity does not necessarily mean you have to have an infinitely long road. I'll show you on the whiteboard. I like to talk with pictures. Infinity doesn't have to mean that you have, sorry, I'm trying to get the pen. You have just an infinitely long road that you know continues endlessly in one way. Infinity can be bouncing back and forth between two uh, boundaries. It can be within a limited place. Like here, like if we were making this road, we'd need so much pavement. Oh my goodness, we'd need an infinite amount of pavement to keep making this infinitely long road. But in this format, we don't need an infinite amount of pavement. All that we need is this amount of pavement, and we can bounce back and forth between these two boundaries in endless or infinite number of times. So we have an infinity of duration. And if I have time, I'm going to get into vortex-based math and how that relates to it because this vortex-based math relates to this. Okay, so so much flapping of my moving mouth parts in order to describe something that is in experience. How do we get across this experience? Are the boundaries like membranes? Yes, the boundaries are exactly like membranes. And here's another one, um, larger and smaller. Yes, microcosmic to macrocosmic. So how do you actually do this dance? So I'll tell you how I do this dance. The first thing is, I'm happy the sun is out today because I got tons of beautiful uh, sunlight in my, my inner eye here. I'll hold this up so that I have a good prop. Uh, one of the first things is the power that makes it go because someone just asked, what makes that convergence point, that central point, what makes it jump in and out? So the answer is, it's that miracle that makes the zeroth dimension suddenly decide to jump into the first dimension and make a line. The power or the energy to make it happen, in my experience, comes from the sun, all right? So I like to joke that I'm solar powered. So for all of my meditations and visualizations and the things that I do on a non-physical, purely energetic level, I use the sun as the source of my energy. So I might use an intermediary like food, but food is not enough for me. So this first we're going to do sun gazing. How do you do sun gazing? Okay, so I usually sit with my legs crossed Indian style or however you would like to describe that, you know, so that my legs are like a pretzel underneath me. And when I sit in that way, it makes a kind of like a bowl, like my lap is like a bowl. And if it's not sunny and beautiful outside, I do this inside, like visually, I visually um, think about my base of my spine, my root chakra, um, connecting with the earth. Like if I physically can be outside, it's not horribly muddy out, I physically sit on the earth. That's the most wonderful, powerful thing. But it's rainy and horrible out a lot of the time. So I sit where it's clean and comfortable. You don't have to just always, you know, whatever, be uncomfortable getting a wet butt doing this. Visualize that the base of your spine is connecting to the core of the earth, and then the other portion of it is the top of you. That visualizing the crown 
uh, very, you know, convergence point top of your energy system is connecting to the sun. So that's not all of it. Physically, I place the tip of my tongue on the roof of my mouth, and it's most comfortable to me when I do it kind of forward towards my teeth, not like, like way back into my soft palate. But guess what? Everybody has to figure out a way that works and it's comfortable for them. Like as an example, my body is not comfortable if I try to sit like in that full lotus position, not for my hips and knees. Do what is comfortable for your body. If you can't sit with your legs folded like a pretzel, that's fine. Sit uh, on comfortable cushions, sit in a way that is comfortable. That is what matters the most. Tongue on the roof of your mouth. And then I do not stare at the sun with my physical eyes. Our physical eyes are delicate and they can be burned out by overexposure, like the photosensitive film of, you know, of a camera or whatever. So you protect your eyes. Most of the time I wear a hat because it's not physical energy that we are talking about connecting with. So I wear a hat or if I'm inside, I'll use the edge of the window so that it is shading my physical eyes. And if the screen or if the camera, is uh, where I would stare. I would stare with my physical eyes at like the bottom, you know, down here, and I would connect with my inner eye to the sun. And when I connect with my inner eye to the sun, this is not a lazy or relaxed activity. Like I love to just be out in the sun and just like lie on a towel and everything like that and be relaxed. This is not that. This is like standing at attention. My spine is erect. And I have described in the past how this area of the body is almost like an elephant's trunk. This is our attention from this area of our body. It's from Greek, attenuos, meaning to reach out towards. I envision it like an elephant's trunk. And this is, it's not, this is why I say it's not a lazy activity. I envision this connector growing forward and connecting with the sun. And I connect with Saul, the sun, the star that is nearest to earth. But you can do this activity. Hello, welcome to anyone who's joining. You can do this activity connecting with your attention to anyone or anything. So that's also part of it. Creating an energetic firewall. So I have to tell you about all of these things that we do. So we've also, we've learned the Merkaba. Well, I'm going to show you briefly, quickly, because I do this recording, getting my photos all together. Scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. I'm going to make funny faces while I scroll. But it's worth it so that I can get to a picture of the Merkaba. Pictures worth a thousand words. Dun, dun, dun. This is the Merkaba. I hope everybody can see it easily on their screen. So uh, we've already gone through this in the webinar series. I do this as a form of encryption. I do this in order to clear the decks. So this is how to do the flying rainbow lasagna. The first thing is I eat a bunch of sunlight. And when I eat the sunlight, I am breathing it in. So I look at the sun, I attenuate to the sun, and I use literally breathing in because when you breathe in through your nostrils, it actually goes up into your sinuses up here and um, integrates with all of these structures that are happening up here. So I am breathing in the beautiful sunlight. And as I breathe in, I feel it filling up my belly. I feel it like food filling up my belly. In the Far East, this, this area of your belly is called your hara, your aura. It is like where you collect your chi. It is where you collect your life force energy. This is what we're doing. We're collecting life force energy. And I breathe it in. And then I'm also at the same time drawing that energy up from the earth, like a plant drawing energy up from its roots. So just this is becoming photosynthetic. This is a human being becoming a practitioner of photosynthesis. Connect with your roots to the plant that planet that you're on. Connect with your crown to the star and then breathe in that energy. And when I breathe in that energy, again, this is not a lazy or relaxed thing that I'm doing. I, I'm like in meditation. I'm at attention. I'm not in my ego. I'm not thinking like, I really got to do the dishes. I really got to do the groceries. I really got to do all of my various chores and my taxes and everything like that. Awesome. I encourage everyone to do this. Safe sun gazing, not with your physical eyes. You can even, you can close your physical eyelids if you need to or, or want to. It's, the light still gets in. And then the, I breathe it in a couple of times. So I, I breathe in, fill up my lower belly. Then I breathe it in more. Then I fill up my heart. I really feel my chest expand. I breathe it in even more. I fill up my high heart, like my chest all the way up to here. I breathe it in even more until I feel like it is all the way up to the top of my head. And then what I do is I send it out through, through my front of my head to hit with the sun, but it circulates back around in through the back of my head and then hits the sun again. I make like a loop-de-loop, -loop. and this is the shape of the ankh. This is where the ankh comes from. So I'll do a little drawing so that you can see it. Uh, here, let me get a proper photo. 
scrolling, 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 and squinting, squinting, squinting. I laugh at myself when I, when I look at these videos and I look at the faces that I make. Here, I just want to find an effective thing that I can draw upon. So let's say if this is, would get the pencil going. If this is the sun, this giant purple dot over here, then this aspect of myself is connecting to the sun. But what I do is I make it go up and around and then back in through the back of my head and then connect to the sun. So it's like making a big giant loop. And that I also internally in my inner world, in the inner vision, when I am doing this correctly, I see a bullseye. Like a, there's violet at the center radiating towards red at the outside and all of that is inside. And it, it's almost like my GPS is telling me when I'm on target. So that's just the first aspect. And I'm gonna drink a little bit of water because I'm talking so very much. So the first aspect of it is getting enough gas in your car. If you wanna make a journey or if you wanna do anything, you wanna get something done, you either need gas in your car or you need uh, energy, you need money to make things happen. So doing the sun gazing is how you get that energy. And then the next thing is I told you the Merkaba. So in beginning, before I begin my flying rainbow lasagna meditation, I'll get to that. Um, I do the Merkaba and that is like creating an energetic firewall. And it is also like creating encryption because like, let's say I want to paint this painting. This square of canvas should be my realm. It should be where I am totally empowered to express myself creatively. And there shouldn't be anyone else who is like picking up my hand and forcing me, you have to use green, you have to use red, you have to use this color or paint this way. No one else should be affecting this creative expression other than me and my divine partner, the stellar network. You know, the higher consciousness that is really innate, that is part of me. So creating that Merkaba, and when I make this, um, movement with my hands. I hope that you're getting understanding because we did that in previous webinars that it is a counter rotating field. So I've got one field that is turning around in this way, one field that is turning around in this way. At this point, I'm very adept. I snap my fingers and I imagine my Merkaba doing, you know, it's, it's turning. It's taken many years of visualizing and I didn't just visualize, I also drew a lot of pictures and made diagrams for myself and made sculptures that I could learn and feel in a tactile sense. So I encourage everyone, first of all, learning the Merkaba is exactly like, Learning music, you, you practice at it and you become more adept and eventually you become a virtuoso by doing it. And that's just like, um, like when you practice your scales, to you're making that muscle memory in your fingers, but the scales aren't even the song. Or when you're, if you're going to be a runner, you're doing your training at the gym, but that's not running the marathon. That's just doing the training. So the Merkaba is not even the actual thing that we are doing. It is the preparation. So I sun gaze first, then I do the Merkaba. And that's like before I start a painting or a drawing, I clear the canvas. I make sure my table is clear. I make sure that my canvas is perfectly white. I wipe and brush away any dust. So that's what I'm envisioning. When I make that little movement, I'm like wiping and brushing away the dust so that I can actually begin. And then let me just drink juice. And then we'll, we'll, we'll dance like a flying rainbow lasagna. So the first aspect of this, and these are all genetic movements. It's a genetic oscillation. And I like to say that it's up and down. Now, I wanna also show you lots and lots of genetic pictures in order to get, this is all about understanding like how, how this is done. And I'm sorry if I get so excited. Um, I put on music in order to do the flying rainbow lasagna dance because I find that music makes me feel in a certain way that I can use as a type of energy. On days when there's not enough sunlight, and we have a lot of rainy days here in Northern California, and it's really hard. I'll, I'll, sometimes I'll put a crystal in my mouth, like a crystal that has been outside in the sun, but if there's no sun, I can get energy from music. And I would encourage you to use music that is inspiring to you. So I have diff uh, different songs on the playlist. Some of them make me feel like, um, you know, like a ballerina, like that feeling of like a beautiful, um, very light, beautiful dancing. Some of them are like heavy metal songs. It can be, yeah, two, 432 Hertz is very profoundly uh, help, helping and healing. But I also want to tell you like 
I won't dictate to anyone else what music you use for your inspiration because music affects each person individually. So, you know, if I put on Jimi Hendrix and I feel like this music is rocking and it makes me feel like I could fly, you know, throughout the whole cosmos. That's my personal experience and I love Jimi Hendrix, but another person might feel like this music is nothing. It's, it doesn't inspire me at all. Choose the songs that actually inspire you. And then the very first part of it is an up and down oscillation. So now I got to show you lots and lots of diagrams of DNA. I hope this will be fun and interesting. And also I have a playlist that's set up on YouTube that's supplemental homework videos and I'll share that link too. It shows you tons of things about DNA supercoiling. So let me show you pictures, pictures, pictures because this is one of the best ways to get across these ideas. And scrolling with my squinty face. Okay, supercoiling. Well, wait, 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 first I should show you. Here, this is better. This is an actual picture. So this is actual DNA. It's an actual electron scanning microscope. And one of the things that you can see, and let's make sure that there's a color that you can actually see. I'm in yellow over here. This is one little strand of your DNA along there, right? And I hope that you can see that there's different grooves. This one over here is very wide compared to this one over here that's very narrow. These are called the major and the minor grooves. So this is literally like music. This is the major groove that I just highlighted in yellow there. And this is the minor groove. These are literally the vibrating strings of your subcellular world and your strings are groovy. You have major and minor groove. I'm gonna show you more pictures. Don't worry, I have to scroll through again though. Here's another picture that's coming up. Okay, this is another actual literal picture of your DNA when it becomes supercoiled. That's one of the first stages of supercoiling and supercoiling means twisting it a whole lot so that it becomes to twist up like a string of yarn. Remember I said, ordinarily your DNA is like an unfurled sweater called chromatin that is inside of your nucleus. And when it's in that, that format of being like a bunch of strings that aren't tightly coiled, it's moving. It's constantly moving. And my, my hand movements are very similar to the way that they move. They move like, um, uh, um, oh my goodness, like arabesques. And they don't just move in one dimension. They move side to side. They move forward. They move up and down, okay? Now I'm going to show you more pictures in order. These are all static images. I'm sorry that science is not sophisticated enough to take moving pictures of DNA, but I'm gonna show you all sorts of other cool things. This is more supercoiling. Okay, so this is going to show you, you have, sometimes your DNA is just shaped like a loop like that, but sometimes your DNA is twisted up into these complex um, like crochet patterns. And I hope that you can see in this diagram, these crochet patterns, this is like over, just like when you knit, Knit one, purl one, over and under, over and under. So th that one's over is in that direction. This one's over is in that direction. This is trying to get you to understand that there's different variables. Like every time you add a new variable, it's like you can create a new combination. Remember I said, I'm giving you the pencil with an eraser so that you can erase out the things you don't want in your genes and write in the things that you do want. The more um, variables you have, the greater degrees of freedom you have in being able to do this. When DNA is supercoiled, it is tons of potential energy. The energy is all stored up by having it be twisted up. So in order for your RNA messengers, and I'll show you pictures of what, what's RNA messenger? Do your homework and watch the um, videos and you'll see videos of this. But I'll show you pictures of what DNA looks like. Where's the picture that I want to show you? I have everything all prepared. Well, wait, first I'll show you more supercoiling. Oh, here, this is what I want. Oh, I can show you two things at once. Even better, okay. There we go. This big blobby thing that I'm highlighting with the scribble right now, that's your RNA messengers. And they swirl along, let me use a better color so you can actually see this. They swirl along the major and the minor groove and they read the, um, the notes, the, the blueprints that are written on your DNA. Sorry. There we go. I can't believe this is working so beautifully. Um, 
uh, yeah, I forget about that yellow line there. It's too hard to erase. I'll switch to a different color. But here you can see, here's a regular loop, plain old boring loop of DNA. But look at what happens. It starts to get twisted up into these complex loops. Oh, and it starts to go around and around. These are proteins called histones. That's like the spool of thread that you can wind, the spool rather, that you can wind a piece of thread around. Here is another complex loop. We've got this and then look, one loop, another loop. So I'm showing you all of these, let's look at my face. I'm showing you all of these diagrams so that you can get an understanding that science is pretty clunky and inelegant at this moment in understanding DNA when it's actually behaving. But DNA is always doing a dance, but they're not, they don't have the eyesight that can actually see what the DNA is doing. And I'll also tell you this little brief anecdote and make sure that I have enough time about how science is understanding DNA. So the way that science understands the sweater of DNA, it would be like saying if you have a, like a Christmas sweater that has a picture of, you know, Christmas tree and Snoopy on it. And if you took that entire sweater, and first of all, you unfurled it, took out all the loops, and then what science does is chops up all of the sweater into little tiny bits, uh, puts it through a chemical analyzer, and determines how much black was in, that color, was in that picture, how much white, how much red, how much green. But science does not look at an overall picture that says, what was next to what? What was this green stuff next to this red stuff, next to this white stuff, next to this black stuff? Science at this moment is not looking at the big picture of what the genetic sweater looks like when it's actually knitted together. And science is not understanding and recognizing the dance movements and how those dance movements, the behavior of genes is affecting the expression of either physical proteins, health and vitality, or I've told you this before, your DNA is not just the expression of what, whether your earlobes are attached or whether you have epicanthic eye folds, your DNA attaches your train cars of reality. Go into the whiteboard here. Remember from the fourth, we're teaching you about the fourth dimension. These are the box cars of reality. They're simplified squares, simplified squares, simplified squares, on and on and on. And the thing that ties them together here, this green stuff, this green stuff that ties together moment to moment on the plank length is the dance of your DNA. So now you understand your DNA and that movement that it is making when it is unfurled on a subcellular level is helping your consciousness move through time. Rearranging your DNA with flying rainbow lasagna means you are rearranging time. Now you're starting to understand why this is desirable, an additional degree of freedom in time, erasing out the events that you don't want to experience in time, and instead writing in the events you would like to experience in time. So I'm drinking juice, and then now we'll get into the actual dance movements of how to do this. And I'm going to stand up, move my chair aside, do the actual dance. I don't stand up when I do the dance, actually. What I usually do is I sit in a, like, I have this lovely lawn chair recliner because I dance with my toes also. So I'll also tell you this. Um, when I do the flying rainbow lasagna dance, it is not based in my ego, just like I was speaking about sun gazing. This rearranging reality at this level means that it's necessary to transcend the daily waking consciousness, that hacked human operating system. It's nonverbal. The flying rainbow lasagna experience is a nonverbal inner experience. And when I'm doing it, I'm not being Aurora uh, because I'm actually connecting with the entire microbial realm, the entire plant and animal kingdom, all life on planet Earth, including all of you. This is getting very profound. I invite people to dance like a flying rainbow lasagna along with me. And it's consensual, it's optional, not mandatory. We are all affecting one another. And I'm move my sculpture so I can play the piano over here. <laughs> Our music is affecting one another, whether we like it or not. Your genes, I said vibrating genes is non-local. What you're thinking and feeling and doing with your genes is affecting me, whether we both like it or not. If you're involved in grief or anger or some other, you know, like some of those lower vibration uh, genetic dances, 
you're going to be affecting everyone else. And this is why, you know, meditation is profound and powerful. The Maharishi effect, or as it's known, you know, the idea that many different minds cohesively working together in peace affects the entire world. This is very truthful. And this is also the hundredth monkey theory, the idea that if enough people in various different locations um, have a momentum for the idea that it will be spread throughout the entire levels of consciousness of that place. This is what, what some people call the morphic field or morphogenic field. This is what is your DNA. DNA, you're connecting through the past and into the future and you're connecting with all of the other people that are here right now. It is ethical to affect other people with your dance. You're affecting others and they are affecting you. I am telling you that I go into a non-ego based state when I do this. So that means I'm not just doing what is good for Aurora in this little individualized container. What I'm actually doing is healing the time field or reweaving the entire structure. Remember how I drew that picture for you that in this webinar that showed all of these guys all stacked up next to each other. And when they vibrate, they all vibrate together. And when they jump up and down, they all vibrate together. This is all us. This is all one experience. This is not individuated experience. These are all our lives across a vast time field dancing together. So you understand we're affecting one another. We're affecting ourselves coming from a vastly different direction, moving at a vastly different rate. This is the ethics of whether you're allowed. Am I allowed to sing? Am I allowed to make a note? Am I allowed to make music? Yes, you are allowed to sing, you're allowed to make a note, and you're allowed to make music. And the idea is that you make it according to the score. You're not just choosing random notes. That's not how I dance like a flying rainbow lasagna. So the other thing that I'm going to tell you is, as you are beginners, do not be concerned about doing all of the complex jazz chords. You can do a very simple chord in order to begin with. And if you can't read the musical score or can't hear the exact note, just dance to the beat. And as you dance to the beat, your hearing actually gets better and you get able to hear what the entire genetic symphony or symphony of life is doing. So how do I dance like a flying rainbow lasagna? After having sun gazed and also eaten some good physical food, I do my Merkaba around me and I have on some wonderful music and music is good because this is actually uh, We have a lot of four four music. This is actually a beat of eight a beat of eight like one two three four five six seven eight all right, I'm gonna point to it around the lasagna I'm probably gonna cover up my face so you can't see me properly, okay? These are the various flanges of lasagna. We've got four on one side and four on the other. So when we go all the way around the lasagna, I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all right? And that means it's a jumping up and down or a jumping back and forth movement eight times. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And the thing that I'm jumping back and forth with is I, I do it with the sun. You can do it with anything. You can do it with another person. You can do it with an abstract concept. Like you can fly in rainbow lasagna with the concept of government. And when you do that, this is integration. This is lovemaking. You are combining your, what is inside of you with what is outside of you. This is making that membrane that separates different things a moot point. We are vibrating this side to this side to this side, making that membrane a moot point. So if you think there's a distinction and a separation between Aurora, the individual, and the sun up there that emitted all this light that made Aurora into a person and all the food that I drink and all the calcium you know, from my bones and everything like that, there's no distinction. And so this is, this is how I do it. So we have a singularity inside of us, like I showed you. You're ordinarily shaped like this, right? Look, you have those beautiful singularities or convergence points inside of you. And in order to do the flying rainbow lasagna, First, I envision the singularity that is inside of me. You could envision it at your heart or inside of your head or wherever works for you. I envision that it jumps outside of me. That's the one, Jump, like the, the one beat, beat one, one, and it makes half of a vortex. Then that same violet point jumps back into me, into me, that's two, and it makes this other half vortex. Then it jumps outside of me, that's three, it makes the outer vortex. 
then it jumps back into me. That's four. It makes another vortex. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay? That's the basic lasagna movement. Like, uh, I'll get fancy because as we're doing that jumping back and forth motion, we can also spin it around like this. So now, oh my goodness, I've got this spinning around like this while I've also got energy jumping back and forth. And remember, I drew that image for you and I said, there's two different basic types of energy, energy that is circular, the path is circular, and energy that is going in a straight line, but that straight line is actually, you're looking at a hula hoop on the edge. So we're actually understanding that it's a big circular path that we're looking at on edge. That's what we're representing with this. We've got the linear energy that is jumping back and forth like a straight line. And we've also got the circular energy making a movement like this. Every time you add a variable, the song can become more complex. If we only have two notes, then that song can't be that complex. I can play one note, another note, or both notes together. But what if I add in a third note? All of a sudden, I can add another layer of complexity. So each one of these movements is like a note for the vibrating strings of your genes. And every time we add another movement, we get another layer of complexity. And this is also like encryption because I want you all to encrypt your genes. Just like on, you know, on my iPad, I'm using my iPad, my technology here, it works on a thumbprint and it says only Aurora is allowed to access the information in this machine. Well, I want all of you to do something similar with your DNA. I want you to encrypt. When you're doing these dances, I want you to make sure like all of the wave patterns don't get squashed by something else that comes along and says, oh, I'm going to change that. I'm going to erase that. I'm going to do what I want. You encrypt it, just like I encrypt my computer, so I say, no, this has a password. If you don't have the password, you don't get access. This is what we all need to do with our DNA. You encrypt your dance so that you're the only person that is erasing events of life and writing those events in, because otherwise this is what we've been doing for the past 10 or 20,000 years, hijacked DNA taking the train cars of reality that you want to be experiencing and instead making you veer off into a different direction. So that's why you're, you're in the advanced jazz band. You gotta learn the proper hygiene in order to do this properly. You do encryption and you also do firewalls. I gotta drink some water. So firewalls, this means it's like being very strong in your own inner vision, your own sense of what you wish to create or emanate. I have artistic firewalls. I show my art pieces to other people and someone might be like, oh, Aurora, that's a lovely piece, but it's got far too much red in it. And I'm like, no, it doesn't. I know it's got just the right amount of red. I know what my paintings should look like. I have a firewall of like a inspiration or ideas that I don't have other people influencing me with their own personal desires. They want a painting that's got more red. I'd be like, you, you, you go paint a painting that looks like that. I paint my painting that looks like this. One sec. So a big part of this is, um, maintaining your own sense of what is right, your own sense of your own trajectory, your own ideas, not allowing other people to influence your reality creation. So when I do my flying rainbow lasagna dance, I rearrange my body, I also rearrange the events of reality. Then I go into reality and I experience the events that I just rearranged. I literally do the flying rainbow lasagna dance, then I look at the news or look at social media and I say, what just changed after this because it is rearranging the possible variables of your own genes and your own trajectory through time and this is affecting the entire time field. So I wanna do the basic movements. This is like up and down. If you think of yourself, like, like imagine, here's a good way to do this. Sungays, do the, um, do the Merkaba, so you've got a nice blank canvas. And then imagine that there's a little tiny version of you, you know, like this, inside of your nucleus. And imagine that you're beginning to jump up and down. And imagine, I'll draw a picture as I do this. Here. Like, let's say, let's say if this is the cell, and this is your nucleus, and let's say this is a loop of DNA inside of there. I want you to be this little red stick figure and I want you to start jumping up and down like that inside of your own body, inside of your own nucleus on a subcellular level. And you envision yourself 
in there, jumping up and down and creating a flying rainbow lasagna. And as you're creating that flying rainbow lasagna, your genes are literally changing. I like to say in, uh, in the other webinars that I did, I said, first, I'm giving you this new software program. Software changes the hardware. And it does. We all understand this. The ideas that our ancestors and that structured human society gave to us created this genetic shape. Ideas that said death is inevitable, aging and decrepitude is inevitable. Did you have an old relative when you were a little tiny child? Did you have an old grandma or grandpa that maybe was like bent over and walked with a cane? And when you were a little tiny malleable child, did they hold you and say, you're going to be old like me one day, or your nose is going to be shaped like me one day, or your eyes will be nearsighted like me one day? This is how those programs are imprinted upon future generations and it's not just the functioning of your physical body it's also your idea structure the ideas that came from the previous generations ideas about how best to survive uh ideas about culture like oh, what's the man's role what's the woman's role how how do you have a relationship ideas about religion about cosmology about where life came from about who is god how is life organized and about how you're supposed to function and then everything that's projected from human society like oh you're supposed to work as a coal miner and then retire after 45 years or you know all the the uh unnatural overlays and social structures that are placed on the genetic music that you want to make if you want to make a beautiful chord like that. And instead, your ancestry and human society and what you've been taught in school and what is allowed by the government will not allow you to make that chord. This is the solution. And that's why some of the music that I put on, I put on headphones when I do my flying rainbow lasagna dance, because I can make it loud and make it, I really like, I, I, I live in a house and with neighbors with other people. If I could, I would have giant speakers. I would have an immersive experience but I put on sometimes music that's like rage against the machine because I am raging against the limitations the imposed limitations of government and human society and religion and ancestors and I'm essentially saying to them fuck you I won't do what you tell me I choose to use the pencil with an eraser and rearrange my genes. I choose to dance like a flying rainbow lasagna. So some aspect of this, there's a little bit of attitude. There's a little bit of like um, uh, being an individualist and choosing to not allow others to uh, structure your life and for you to be free. That's what this is. This is about uh, total freedom. And when you have total freedom, it also means like, I don't tell you what to do with it. This is given to you. You can do with it what you want to do with it, but it's an uncorruptible program. So it's not like you're going to drink this like a magic elixir and then it will turn you into like the most evil devil ever. That is not what this is about. This, because I, I think I mentioned, when I do the flying rainbow lasagna, I go into a non-ego based state. And that is what the state that we're in. I don't know if you've ever taken a psychedelic or if you've ever had an experience where you could just press pause on your ego. And when you can dilate your sense of self and you can dilate your identity, like expand your identity to identifying with the entire planet. Um, yeah, a person's asking, does this slow down aging? This not only slows down aging, this rearranges the structure of consciousness as it combines with the cells of your body so that there's no more friction. Aging comes from friction. Like every thought that we have in our mind, that is the um, sound equivalent of friction. Just like if you, a uh, Harley Davidson motorcycle, these guys with like their loud motorcycle, I want to say to them, the sound of your engine shows that it is inefficient and is letting out heat and uh, other energies. Um, your mind making verbalizations is the example of friction moving through time. And when we're in bliss, like when I'm painting or when I'm, when I'm playing a song that I'm really good at on the piano, not if I'm just learning something, but if I really know the song, then I'm like, I'm in bliss. I don't have to think, move your pinky, move your hand, move your thumb, move your this. Or if I'm um, you know, painting, I'm like, I know exactly which color to paint. I know exactly how to do it. Everything is going right. I don't have to think like paint red, paint green, paint it. Like you, you are in bliss or in your true mind when you don't have those frictions, that clunky, like now I have to think this, now I have to think this. I'll give you, I'm giving you examples. I can literally feel my genes change in their dance movements when I have to do a stupid phone prompt. Like, 
oh, I have to call the bank. If you want this, press one. If you want this, press two. If you want this, press three. And I feel my DNA, which is ordinarily dancing in these wonderful lasagna shapes, I feel it start to go in a different way and start to dance like human society wants me to dance. So I hate all of those things. Though these are um, emotional programs that change the running of our hardware. Your software changes the functioning of your hardware. This is what I've said. So previous webinars, I said, I'm gonna give you a new software program for your organic computer. I'm gonna tell you about the time field. I'm gonna tell you about these possibilities. Just telling you about those possibilities began to transform the actual physical structure of the body. Now you actually um, get to apply those concepts to your actual physical structure. Thinking these thoughts and doing these movements and doing these visualizations changes the way your genes are behaving. This is epigenetics. That's why I have in the supplementary homework, um, there's good stuff about Bruce Lipton. He's an excellent biological um, um, scientist, an evolutionary biological scientist, and he is um, bringing really good sense into the idea of the code that rules the code. That's what epigenetics is. So this is a new uh, dance movement that you can use in order to rearrange your DNA and have a completely new experience. So the first movement is just an up and down, I'm jumping up and down, up and down, making this beautiful lasagna, but it's not just an up and down, that's like one note or two notes. I'm gonna add another variable. I'm gonna do side to side. So on the one hand, I'm jumping up and down, like it's the X axis. Now on the other, I'm gonna add another movement. I'm gonna add the Y axis. So now I have various sculptures prepared to show you this. So imagine I've got a super position. You can't see it very well with this, with this camera, but I wanted to show you, you've got one that's moving like this and you've got one that's moving like this and they are super imposed on each other. And every time you're doing this, you are rearranging those last moments of death on the membrane of death. And I'm gonna get into vortex-based math in terms of rearranging this too, but I don't wanna you know, um, give, uh, I wanna fully explore this before I get into vortex-based math. One is jumping up and down like this. One is vibrating left and right like this. That's not the end. We can also do in and out. So I've got, I'm jumping up and down like this on an interior level in the actual nucleus. I'm jumping up and down like this. I'm also, I'm moving side to side inside of the nucleus, like an accordion. I'm squeezing in and out like this. Guess what I also do from my heart? I'm also projecting forward and then scooping it back in. Imagine it's going out behind my, my back, behind my hair and hitting the wall and then forward and then back to you. So I'm also doing that movement. And every time we add this additional variable, we get more complexity. And then there's also this rotational movement. That's not the end, because we also have end over end, end over end. So now we've got all these different movements that we can do. We can do vibrating like this, vibrating like this, vibrating like this, and we can do end over end, end over end. This is like saying, hey, these are the basic notes of the octave. Notes, eight notes. You can make a lot of songs out of eight notes. With those eight notes, we can play Mozart, we can play David Bowie, we can play anything, we can play Jimi Hendrix. So giving those basic movements of the flying rainbow lasagna, those are like the basic notes of the music. And then it becomes possible to uh, rearrange your own DNA. And while you're doing that, you're affecting all of the life around you. This is not just you swimming around in your own private kiddie pool. This is you as a advanced jazz band musician playing some very unusual, innovative chords. That's the other thing, okay? Innovative. When we dance in these patterns, we are creating something new. We are doing new things that have never, breaking new ground in time. So this is very big because there's a lot of AI that is uh, operating right now. There's non-terrestrial artificial intelligence and there's terrestrial artificial intelligence. And neither of those systems have the capacity to innovate in the way that you or I, organic life with a creative life force energy can innovate. We can write new songs. We can have new poetry. We can make new ideas. We can, we can make new babies, right? You can have a new baby come out of you. We can make new skin cells. We can use the flying rainbow lasagna in order to do a totally new dance. If these are 
the basic notes of reality, I can give them to you and you can say, cool, I'm going to write my own music. I'm going to write my own song. I'm going to innovate and make something new that's never happened before. And the music, the music that we're making is events in reality. I'm going to put my chair over and sit down and everything. Events in reality. This is why I don't keep flying rainbows on you a secret only for me. I don't want to be like, oh, I'm a mad scientist in my lair, rearranging reality and it's only for me. I actually want to introduce you as new notes in the symphony and achieve greater levels of complexity and greater levels of innovation that cannot be um, co-opted by artificial intelligence. When we do this, Flying Rainbow Lasagna rearrangement. It's like spontaneous lovemaking with the cosmos. And it leads to unpredictability. Here's another good analogy. If you do a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, so brilliant and comedic, wonderful book, wonderful movie. It's the infinite improbability drive. You press the big red button, that's pressing the infinite improbability drive. Yes, the meaning of life is 42. And then anything can happen out of that. Humanity, creative life force energy, and flying rainbow lasagna. These are aspects of pressing the big red button. Press the infinite improbability drive. Introduce a new variable. Make something new happen. And it's not just Aurora that gets to make something new happen. Like a new aspect of health or vitality, a healing, spontaneous healing, whatever rearrangement of reality is required. It can be a spontaneous rearrangement of reality on the level of government or on the level of a structure of society. Because I was saying to you how all of those things affect and limit your DNA. Religion, you can fly in rainbow lasagna in your own body and have that profoundly change the religious structure of the world around you. And it is having this profound change. Hold on a second, I'm gonna check the time and I wanna get into vortex-based math. Uh, 15 minutes in order to do some vortex-based math. This is really awesome. And then I'll get to all the chats and all the questions. And also, pardon me, pardon me again. Uh, I appreciate so much that you guys are letting me. I know I'm going really fast because I have about a gigabyte worth of recording space. And so that's why I want to get through it super fast. And then I'll go to all the questions and the, the fine points of all of it. So in one of the other videos that I did, let me put my sculpture down too. One of the other videos that I did on YouTube, someone put a really astute comment about how this shape is related to vortex-based math. Yes, 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 and I love that person for saying so, and now I'm going to show you what vortex-based math is and how it relates to the torus. I know, I get so excited about talking about these concepts. I'm squinting and scrolling, squinting and scrolling. Okay, so first of all, okay, I hope you can all see this. Um, diagram here. This is not my original diagram. Uh, let me choose a color that you can actually see, like um, here, like uh, light blue. This over here, this is a little diagram of your DNA, just like I've been drawing. And this that is on top of it, this is what is known as vortex based math. I don't know if you can even see that. I'm going to try a different color so that you can really, really, uh, here, hopefully this will work can see this. Well, it might be a little bit hard, but hopefully you can see that there are numbers all the way around this diagram. We're starting with one over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine is up here, but nine is also this convergence point in the center that another person was very astute and that they were saying, hey, that convergence point, that zeroth dimension at the center of the sculpture is very similar to the nine in the vortex-based map. Yes, it is. Here, I'm going to highlight. You see these? Oh, let's change a different color. You can't even see. Here, now you can see it better, hopefully. That in yellow, this super messy scribble. But that, what I just highlighted, is pretty much the same as this cross-section that I'm always drawing. Here, like this cross-section of the torus, okay? So you can see here, this is one, this is the other, and this would be the um, hourglass shape that is at the center, rewinding and rewinding so you can actually see. So this is the idea in uh, vortex-based math that instead of numbers behaving in a linear equation like here, you know, one plus one equals two, 
what we are understanding is that numbers are behaving according to vectors and a vector is like a direction of energy moving here let me use yellow so you can kind of see so when these numbers over here move along one of these lines and I'm drawing a big arrow like that's the direction that it is moving along that line it has a numerical function either like it doubles or it halves and all of these numbers work together in order to create the different structures of math I'm not going to get into all of it because it's very complex um, basically it has to do with the digital root of a number like if I add together uh, I find a color so you can see here, eight plus eight equals 16. But then I have a one and a six, so 16 actually reduces down to seven. So in going around this vortex-based math structure, this to torus or donut shape, what, as you begin to do the doubling and halving, when you add together your number that is the end result of your calculations you keep on getting the same root you keep on getting all of the roots over here right up to five and all the roots over here right up to four and all the roots over here right up to three so it's a new way of visualizing math and you can see how it integrates very well with the dna structure and there's more about this when you look at uh this area that i'm highlighting over here this this is a donut shape so you're understanding that this is like the cross section of the numerical donut and this is the three-dimensional representation of that donut and i don't know if you can see it if it's clear enough for you to see but on the surface of that donut there are all, all these numbers and the numbers are very much like sudoku have you ever played sudoku i don't know if you have in sudoku here i'm just trying to draw in a little space so you can see you have like tic-tac-toe but you have to have all of the numbers from from one through nine uh, represented so you can't have like two twos or three threes or one seven it's a, it's a you know it's a math um, it's a math challenge this is very similar I'm highlighting like a row of numbers on here so I hopefully you can see that so it's a, it's a donut and the donut is made of circles that go around it and each one of these circles has to have all of the numbers from one to nine and it all fits together as a giant puzzle with none of the numbers repeating back to my face. All of this has to do with the final denouement of your life, all right? Remember in previous webinars, I've described like looking at this lower quadrant of the sculpture, that this is like the membrane of death. And this is the final denouement or the convergence of all of the final moment rather of all of the um, sorry, my words, my mind is going way faster than my words. Draw the time field. This is that lower quadrant. And I simplify it by showing these, let's say they're red timelines going up like this, but we, we all know that they actually go around like this. This is the one timeline that actually exits these membranes and goes back to infinity or continues to infinity. And these blue dots these giant blue dots that i'm making those are like the snapshots of the last moment of death and the snapshot contains this timeline as you know the like your memories your recordings of what you have experienced up into that moment so all of these snapshots or last moments we can now understand them as being numbers and the numbers have to be arranged in just the right way when you do flying rainbow lasagna we have superposition we have half of the numbers are down here half of the time and the numbers are up here half of the time these are numbers these are uh, the numerical descriptor of events and these are genetic codons these are combinations of letters of your genes half of the time they are in this lower position half of the time they're in the superposition let's draw it for you Here's one torus that is cross section simplified. And here's a different color, and half of the time it is up here like this. That's the worst circle I've ever drawn. Let's try it again. There we go. 
So I hope you can see that there's areas of coincidence. I'm going to highlight the areas of coincidence. Come on, pen work. See where I'm in yellow over here? Those are the areas where these two different positions actually overlap. And let's say that this is, uh, let's say it's written words. And this is what the sentence says when the Taurus is in this position. And maybe uh, I'm trying to draw, there we go. This is what the sentence is like when the DNA is in that position. So we have two different versions of the rearrangement of the letters is what I'm trying to say. And so now in choosing, choosing which, let's say I want to choose the T from down here, but then the next letter maybe I want to choose is the O from up here. And then maybe the next letter I want to choose is the F from down here. And then maybe the next letter I want to choose is the E from up here. I get more variables. I get greater degrees of freedom. This is what it means. When you add an additional dimension, you add an additional degree of freedom. Jumping up and down is adding another dimension. Getting an additional degree of freedom is like saying I'm a little ant that no longer has to walk all the way across the surface of time. I can now fold time, space, and reality to me. More important things about what's going on. I have five more minutes on vortex-based math. So vortex-based math, if you check out the, the, the math part of it and the numbers part of it, if you really love that and if it really is interesting to you, just drinking juice. But if you're into what is called zero point or free energy, then look even more into vortex-based math. Because now I'm going to draw for you what is known as a rodent coil. So if this is, you know, the basic donut shape, and that's like the donut hole that I just highlighted there. A rodent coil is what happens when you take copper wire and you make this complex winding of basically figure eight. So you've got one that's around like that, and then you have another one that's around like that, and another one that's around like that and another one that's around like that, all the way around this, this shape. So that what you end up having is, you know, I draw these donuts in cross section and it's as if there is, I'm highlighting in yellow, there's nothing there. The, the, um, the circles touch perfectly, but in reality, there has to be a gap there so that wires can get through that gap. So now in this area over here, I'm making a big giant yellow donut hole. That's the area where the wires don't go in the rodent coil and magical things happen because of electromagnetism. If you've done the supplementary homework lessons, then you know all about how electrons moving in a wire create a magnetic field at 90 degrees to the motion of the electron. That's more of that something is moving straight and then there's the complementary um, circular pathway of energy around it. These are some of the, the topical themes of the presentation today. Uh, that magnetic field that is around the, um, the path of the moving electron gets amplified in wonderful and weird ways according to the rodent coil. So with the rodent coil, let's say we've got a cross section where that's the base and that's the base. And then these are the, the red is like the wires that are moving through there. The red moves like this and like this and like this and like this. And it creates these really wonderful magnetic fields that are circular surrounding these coils. And what happens is this inner area that I'm highlighting in yellow develops um, a very powerful magnetic field. If you look at some of these videos, it's the, do the donut is here like this, and it is a copper coil that you know, is surrounded like a plastic or an inert substrate. Um, electricity is put through the copper coil. The electricity is turned off, but the center donut hole of the rodent coil continues to have a magnetic field and you can levitate a little neodymium ball up there like even when the apparatus is no longer connected darn it i don't know why you're getting a blank screen but i hope you can see my face tell me when you can see my face we're doing it for the recording drinking some juice can you guys see me okay i hope you can see me okay well anyway when you have that good when you have that rodent coil there's you can just do a YouTube or I can do the search for you and I'll add it to the supplementary class materials. 
the apparatus itself, even when it is disconnected from electrical current, maintains these unusual energy properties of being able to uh, levitate that little magnet. It also does other interesting things. For example, more energy comes out of it than goes into it. Theoretically, energy that goes into it should um, degrade slightly and less energy should come out than goes into it. But you can put in like enough energy to run two little tiny LED lights into one of these rodent coils and it amplifies that energy. So now you can run 90 lights at uh, the same amount of energy. So I'm trying to say, uh, if you research vortex-based math, a lot of traditional mathematicians will poo-poo will poo -poo it. They'll say this is mystical nonsense, it means nothing, but they're very reticent to change or reticent to having to do yoga of the perception and look at something new and interesting and different. And to me, the really interesting thing is when we begin to apply these new theoretical concerns to actual physical experimentation and see how it relates to the physical world, we get uh, new and interesting ways of energy expressing itself. And then my idea is, just gonna draw this for you and then I'll get to questions. If we, if you, if let's say if this is a rodent coil, that what would happen if we attached it to some kind of an apparatus and we made it jump up and down very fast? You know, if we made that rodent coil when it had electricity going through it, jump up and down very fast because half of the time the coil would be making a magnetic field up in this position and half of the time it would be making a magnetic field down in this position. And I am telling you this, this is very similar to that movie Contact with Jodie Foster, where the Earthlings receive special blueprints from a space race. And at first they're looking at the blueprints and they're thinking that these are blueprints that all are two dimensional, like pages that fit together like this and they can't make sense of it. It wasn't until they started to understand the blueprints have to be wrapped around a cube-like structure and that, that is how you read them that they actually got blueprints not for a free energy device but for a device that allows you to access higher dimensions and i am thinking that the rodent coil is in its least interesting format applied to the capacity to get more energy for my light bulb that's not very creative. That's like the Green Lantern. Green Lantern has the capacity to imagine anything that he possibly wants, and he imagines a gun to shoot his way out of his you know, predicament. That's like the lamest imagination in the world. So using the rodent coil merely to imagine a cheaper or more efficient source of energy to make my light bulb in my studio work is like not very imaginative. We can use that apparatus to begin to rearrange reality, but it requires just like that movie, international collaboration and collaboration across many various disciplines like spiritual, scientific, and the general population. So we're, we're not there yet, we're on the journey there, but that's why I'm giving you like these dance movements. As you begin to do this dance movement in your own body, you'll begin to uh, let go of the, um, calcified structures, like the solidified structures of thought that say, what is possible in reality? Like what is possible in reality? Is free energy possible? But I'll also tell you free energy isn't free. Like it's actually energy that's coming from another zone. So now you have to be much more ethical in what we're doing. Um, let me also just check the time. I'm gonna end the recording for right now. Thank you for everyone who's tuned in and watched this. And now I'm gonna open the floor to all sorts of questions. Let me just do stop the recording.